Hola, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Elijan el saludo que mejor les vaya. Bienvenidos a un nuevo episodio de Repensando el Mañana, el ciclo organizado por la, el Espacio Fundación Telefónica, donde tratamos de arrojar algo de luz sobre el mundo que nos deja la pandemia del COVID-19. Me llamo Pablo Colomer, soy subdirector de la revista Política Exterior y este es el tercer debate de una serie con la que estamos presentando el último número de la revista, aquí lo tenéis, dedicado, a ver si se ve, dedicado, como no podía ser de otra manera, a la pandemia del COVID-19. En el primer debate hablamos sobre las consecuencias geopolíticas de la pandemia. En el segundo, sobre economía y tecnología. Y en este tercer debate quiero hablar sobre salud, ciencia y sostenibilidad. Para ello cuento conmigo con tres de los autores que participan en el número de la revista. Tengo a Gonzalo Fanjul, director de análisis de políticas del Instituto de Salud Global de Barcelona. A William Cares, vicepresidente ejecutivo para salud y políticas de EcoHealth Alliance. Y a Catherine Macadaba, asesora de políticas en la misma organización, en EcoHealth Alliance. Y es que en esta crisis... Quizá como en ninguna otra, la ciencia, los científicos han tenido la palabra. Y en muchas ocasiones, por fortuna, la, la última palabra. Lo hemos visto en la mayoría de los países, eh, con epidemiólogos, <coughs> farmacólogos, inmunólogos, estadísticos, codeándose las ruedas de prensa de igual a igual con primeros ministros y presidentes. Esos mismos expertos, por cierto, que ya nos habían advertido de que, de que esto pasaría de que no era tanto una cuestión de si sucedería, sino de dónde, cómo y cuándo. Es en lo que la jerga internacionalista llamamos un cisne gris. Aunque en la anterior charla sobre economía hablábamos de rinocerontes grises, eh, en cualquier caso, con independencia del, del animal que nos ha pasado por encima, estamos ante un acontecimiento altamente probable, con capacidad de poner el mundo patas arriba, pero que sin embargo cuando llega produce una gran sorpresa. Y ahora lo que estamos es en tratar de recuperar el tiempo perdido y a marchas forzadas. El asunto más urgente es encontrar una vacuna o varias, porque sin una vacuna la normalidad, sea nueva o vieja, más o menos llevadera, eh, no va a llegar. En estos momentos hay casi 200 vacunas en desarrollo para el COVID-19. Estamos metidos en una especie de carrera global que recuerda en parte o bastante a la carrera espacial de los años 60. Porque no se trata solo de una carrera científica tecnológica, eh, también tiene un componente propagandístico de reputación. Y me gustaría empezar por aquí el debate. And I would like to start with eh, Gonzalo, whose organization, el Instituto de Salud Global de Barcelona, is helping in the international effort to, to develop a safe and effective vaccine as soon as possible. So next pair are even talking about having one this year, but then we, we, we will need to produce them in huge quantities and make sure that uh, everyone has equal access to them. Because in a pandemic, in spite of the lockdowns, uh, until everyone is safe, no one is safe. So, Gonzalo, uh, how is the race for the vaccine going from the clinical point of view, but more important from the political point of view? Because it seems that we are, in spite of a collective effort, we, we, are, we, we are seeing a more winner's take it all game, each actor competing against the other. What, what's your insight? Thank you, Pablo, and thank you very much for the invitation and hello to everybody that is listening to us. Um, I think you have described it well. I think that uh, we are living extraordinary times for many different reasons. We are facing extraordinary risks. And certainly I believe that uh, the response that we are providing, both from the scientific and the global governance uh, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, must be extraordinary. And, and in fact, uh, the number of vaccines, the number of uh, uh, vac uh, candidate vaccines that you have mentioned uh, has no precedence. Uh, the rate... Mm -hmm. 
uh, to get a scientific response, the diversity of the different approaches that have been taken from the different from the scientific uh, perspective, the fact that uh, we uh, at least if, if we are a little bit optimistic in the in the process of one year or one year and a half, we might have a vaccine in the in the market that is that is all of that is absolutely uh, extraordinary and and uh, and to be frank uh, and this is uh, this is uh, an strange thing to say from a scientific organization we are mm -hmm. less concerned about the scientific aspects of this uh, mm -hmm. of these debates than about all the other aspects that you have mentioned uh, before i think that when it comes to this vaccine, uh, particularly the vaccine, this is less so uh, when we talk about treatments and diagnosis, mm -hmm. but particularly yeah. uh, for the vaccine, I think that first of all we are facing an extraordinary challenge in terms of the production and distribution of the mm -hmm. of the vaccine. Just to give uh, 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 listeners uh, uh, an illustration, uh, right now we have the capacity to produce 200 million vials. Uh, this uh, mm -hmm. is yep. uh, like crystal uh, um, um, uh, uh, recipients uh, for the vaccine right now, and we might be needing something along the lines of various billions of uh, of vials yeah. uh, if we were to cover the whole population it, it, it depends on the estimation but it could be over five billion uh, uh, per mm. year uh, we do have a fundamental problem of distribution of the vaccine that is true for any other vaccine that we are dealing with i mean if we think about uh, organizations such as gavi uh, mm. the, the global alliance for vaccines and immunization uh, they are the first ones to recognize that almost 90 percent of the children in this planet uh, belong Below, uh, 12 months do not have all the all the uh, vaccines recommended by the WHO so it's extremely difficult to reach the populations despite of the extraordinary advances that we have uh, uh, covered in the in the in the last years no? and that is why I think that what we are seeing is also extraordinary in terms of the creativity of the new models of governance and financing that we are we are seeing in place uh, uh, very recently the ACT accelerator, which is the new governance uh, structure that has been designed in order to deal with the diagnosis, the treatments, and the and the vaccines, is something that has no precedence. And and, and it is our, our our understanding that it is going to change the way we have governed global health uh, in the last years. Of course, we still need and a strong democratic multilateral organization uh, like the WHO playing the role that it has to play. We are not saying that, that it shouldn't play a role, but it's obvious that there are many other actors in these in these debates that must have a very relevant uh, role. This is also related with the creativity in the financing of the of the of the vaccine. Global health has been an area of uh, of considerable uh, innovation in the in, in terms of vaccines. It's sorry, in terms of financing uh, instruments like the in, uh, the IFIM, the International Financial Facility for Immunization, instruments like the Advanced Market Commitments. These are all the results of the creativity uh, in, the, in the development area that we have not seen uh, in other areas. No? But let me finish with something that we are very concerned about that that you mentioned at your in your question. Which which is the issue of who owns the vaccine, the, the, mm -hmm. the property. And I believe this is, again, another area where we are, we are I mean, if, if we are intelligent, I think we are, we are about to see important transformations in the statu quo, in the business as unusual. I think we now have uh, two extreme positions. One is the statu quo, the way the intellectual property regime that we have seen in the last um, 25, uh, 30 years since the, since the WTO uh, agreement. And on the other extreme, the idea that all kinds of intellectual property should disappear. I think that we are going to see something, a solution that is goes somehow in the middle. First of all, we need to guarantee that the common interest is above the private uh, uh, property of the, mm -hmm. of the vaccine. But then I think that we can also be creative in introducing positive incentives beyond the, 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 the negative, the coercive uh, incentives, positive incentives in order to facilitate the participation of different actors. Maybe this is something that we can discuss uh, later. So these are all the elements that are on the table far beyond the strict scientific debate and challenge, mm -hmm. it's a fundamental one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Gonzalo. Um, regarding the critical field of prevention, the, the other side of the coin, of not having to run the 100-meter race to, to get a vaccine, I would like to speak with uh, William, 
about about it uh, because it seems that today prevention is more necessary than ever but more difficult as well we are living in a world full of epidemic risk with more with more human interaction with animals uh, a boom in international travel the mega cities uh, resembling petri dishes and climate change which is uh, shifting the geographic spread of some diseases like sick or malaria William, how this anthropogenic era, this world shaped by humans, is creating what seems a free buffet for zoonotic diseases? <laughs> because it seems like a biblical revenge from nature. Um, yes, indeed. It could be a biblical revenge if the viruses and the bacteria had that consciousness level of thinking about it. <laughs> uh, but I think, Hopefully you know, not. <laughs> living organisms just take advantage of opportunities to grow. Um, and I think what we've done in modern times is provided more of those opportunities. Certainly part of the risk is that there are 8 billion people on the planet. And so we are uh, covering more of the planet. We're living more closely together. And as you said, with modern times, there's travel and trade and movement, mm -hmm. which changes an epidemic to a pandemic because it can spread by definition, of course, amongst the continents. I think we have made amazing advances, medical advances, of course. Um, so the vaccine story is so encouraging and exciting. I don't know that we're making the same level of advances in other parts of society that we need to, to reduce the number of these diseases, reduce the impact of them as they occur, um, and, and really talk about prevention the way you're talking about. And yeah. we do that with other, of course, in other parts of societal problems that we deal with. So if you think about traffic accidents, mm -hmm. uh, and mortality, people dying in traffic accidents, um, we have not, we've really engaged that across different parts of society. We don't leave that up to doctors in emergency rooms and then tell everybody they can drive as fast as they want and they don't need to use seat belts and cars can be really dangerous and roads can have holes in them. And no, we don't need insurance. We'll just let the emergency room doctors fix it after it happens. So we don't do that in society. We have driver's education. We have highway safety design. We have engineers engaged in the way cars are designed. So it's, we mm -hmm. take an all society approach to reducing the number of people that die in traffic accidents. So really the premise is that we should do that for health also. Um, we may be a little biased because I live in the United States and our healthcare system is somewhat response oriented. We have a, we get paid doctors, the medical system only gets paid to give treatments. So we're not really, even in our system, we don't think about prevention as a worthwhile investment in healthcare. So there might be actually some deeper rooted biases in our culture here in the United States that might not always exist in other countries. And I haven't really thought about that a lot or explored it, but it is one thing to consider because there's something about um, that the prevention doesn't seem to be a big part of our approach. And that might be just human nature in general, um, that we don't weigh risk properly, that we're not very good with risk evaluation as human beings um, until the big problem happens. Mm -hmm. It's uh, <laughs> a little bit pessimistic, but it's it's a reality, yeah. Uh, thanks, William. Uh, Catherine, following uh, William's thought about uh, prevention, how, how do we push politically to involve all these much-needed actors uh, to deal with the massive challenge we are we are facing now? I think we have to shift our lens a bit. So really, these are not just public health issues that we face. Yeah. They're really environmental issues, animal health issues, animal production systems, mm -hmm. extractive industries, you know, trade and travel. It's kind of across the board. And I think this is the opportunity here. And, and we really believe in the One Health approach. And this is mm -hmm. the connection between humans, animals, and the environment. It's actually something we deal with in our everyday life. If we if we kind of think more closely and if we have pets, we get them vaccinated against rabies. That's a One mm -hmm. Health approach, prevention at the source. If we have seasonal allergies like I do, you know, we're very aware of our mm -hmm. environmental interactions and how we can minimize those risks and impacts. And um, But I think we have to do that more on a, 
a, a broader scale and say, how are we changing our environment? You know, what implications will that have for our health? Not just for infectious disease, but really, you know, across the board in terms of water security, food security, but then going back to the infectious disease piece, which is, you know, really warranting that, that broader lens, thinking about how do we anticipate these outbreaks in the future? How do we actually reduce risk? So I think that's a more hands on deck approach and quite honestly, you know, an opportunity and a really exciting one to leverage new insights, perspectives, resources, you know, freeing up those resources is, is challenging if you're only approaching it from one sector. So if you bring in other sectors that are already doing relevant work, already have that information that we need, we can actually leverage that in a very cost effective way. Uh, in terms of the challenge of doing that, the way we approach these issues are typically really fragmented. And I think that's something that we need to have a more honest dialogue about at global level, at national level. Mm -hmm. We've seen really exciting developments with One Health coordination platforms at country level that are kind of embracing this coordinated approach, recognizing that there's no other way to do it, you know, based on the limited resources. Resource scarcity is a major issue in, in many countries or most or all countries, um, but especially those that already have very limited diagnostic capacity so that if you have a novel pathogen spilling over, you're not likely to be able to catch it right away. That's a, a you know big challenge, but a big opportunity too for technological innovation. But really at that community level and person, person level or company level, when you're changing those interactions or having those interactions with wildlife or domestic animals or, or uh, vectors, it's thinking, you know, what are what do we need to know to reduce our risk and, uh, and, and, you know, really prevent ideally, but then also be able to detect rapidly and respond rapidly. And I, th I think when we look at uh, global institutions, we need to be more honest about our blind spots and what we're not addressing. You know, what sectors are not at the table, especially for the global health security agenda? Why is the environment sector not fully at the table yet? And how, how can that really be uh, a focus of capacity development where needed, surveillance systems, just so that it's a seamless system and, and you bring it up to the level that it needs to be and can really contribute positively? Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, going back to, to Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo, in your article, you mentioned that uh, due to this pandemic, the, the health is uh, starting to be seen uh, as an investment rather than an expense. We see the, cell, the health system uh, vindicated around the world, sometimes with hard pride, as one of the pillars of society. But, but it seems to me a nationalistic, a reactive move more than a, um, a proactive and international one, despite the fact that this crisis is essentially global. So do, do you think we will see a significant push for a universal health coverage, something very needed in, in, during a pandemic, to fight the, a pandemic? Because I'm not very optimistic, uh, given the current state of inter the international arena, uh, sick with uh, protectionism. What do you think? I, um, we opened the, the article in Politica Exterior mm -hmm. with an image that to me was stri uh, striking, which is the image of Boris Johnson coming out. Well, two, two striking things in the, in, the, in the first press conference of Boris Johnson after he went out of the hospital, no? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing was uh, uh, thanking immigrants uh, for, for the work that they were doing for him, which is something extraordinary in itself. Ironic, yeah. <laughs> Ironic for somebody like Johnson. But the second thing I, I thought was, was, was really going back to the NHS and going back to the public health system, the national health system in the, uh, in the UK, as one of the most important public treasures of the of the of the country, and actually he should know because it was a, a, a critical in in the campaign a pro Brexit, and and I think that this is a feeling that uh, many of us feel in our countries, in uh, particularly in European countries and, and in other and in other countries, uh, the public health systems are seen as as a fundamental 
a protection net uh, as a as a as a source of security uh, as a protection ag against that uh, what we call in the in the uh, in the in the language of global health the catastrophic uh, uh, expense no that is the the possibility that you can really get indebted for life uh, because of a disease so this is absolutely critical in this regard but also it is something very political i think that uh, in the in the intervention that william uh, made about uh, the the us we know that the situation the perception of of the public system in the us is much more controversial in this regard when the uh, international community introduces universal health coverage as an objective within the uh, uh, sustainable development goal number three it is doing possibly one of the most political movements that we have seen in the international development agenda. It is guaranteeing a right, not just an aspiration for some technical uh, achievement at the end of this process, but basically a fundamental, a fundamental uh, uh, right. No, and I think that the message that they are sending is a similar message to other key areas of the public interest, which is what is fair in this case, what is just, is also intelligent. It is in our in our common interest to guarantee that the whole majority of, the, of our society is protected. It's under the umbrella of a system that is protected. And this is the situation that we have seen very clearly, very bluntly, very tragically during COVID. The fact that part of our society has been kept out of the radars of the public health system has been an epidemiological uh, threat. Uh, and, and we are seeing that and we are seeing this in many areas uh, of the world. So I think that you can either get to this debate through the door of social justice and through the door of, of human rights or, or, the, or you can either get through the door of a, a global health security, through the door of a, our common interest and our mutual dependence when it comes to, the, to dealing with this kind of a, a, a epidemics. And therefore, uh, I think that we need to, to grab that uh, opportunity. No? I think that even for those governments that take a more protectionist or nationalist uh, approach, I think that it is easy to understand that uh, our health, our well-being depends on the health and the well-being of others. Uh, if, if we have almost one billion people uh, in the planet that has to pay over, that has to spend uh, between ten and, uh, um, and more of their of their of their uh, ten percent or more of their of their daily income uh, in health, and they are they are really vulnerable to this catastrophic expense. Then we we have a problem in terms of responding uh, to a to a, um, a to an epidemic uh, like this. So in that regard, I am optimistic. I think that. We have the financing. I think that we have the argument for the efficiency of the spending. And I think that we have the argument for the equity of the spending. Those three elements are the, the, the critical uh, uh, pillars that are going to underpin the idea of universal health coverage. And I, I am hopeful that this is going to get a push in the international community in the years to come between now and 2013. Mm. Let's, let's hope. <laughs> To see that, uh, th thanks, Gonzalo. Um, I would like to go back to the topic of the scientists and the role of hard science in this crisis, asking both Catherine and William uh, about it. Uh, why do you have to fight so hard in order to be listened? Because it reminds me the challenge of the climate change. The dilemma between mitigating the, the global warming and pushing for economic growth. In this case, uh, discussing about closing or opening the economies. Are we are seeing in the cases of uh, US or Brazil. This dilemma is always used by some actors as an excuse to inaction or reaction in some cases. Do you think this crisis is going to help in that regard? or we will see a new line draw between the concerned and the unconcerned. I, I don't know who wants to, to go first. Catherine, Maybe William to <laughs> Catherine, okay. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it's so much concerned and unconcerned, but perhaps, you know, awareness and maybe a, a, a matter of priorities. So I think a lot of people have, have put in very genuine efforts to reduce risk from this current outbreak, the current pandemic, and mm -hmm. care a lot about their own health and the health of their community and family. So I think people are really putting in a fair effort. But at a certain point when you're competing 
with priorities with can I pay my rent? Can I feed my family? Can I get treatment for other diseases? These are fair trade-offs, which you know people are concerned about. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that. And I think we have to be really honest about people are putting in the efforts that they can and that there's you know some point where there's something not acceptable to to an individual or a community or the the negative impacts of changing their societal structure will actually you know outweigh the benefits of more restrictive mm -hmm. approaches so i think those discussions are ones we have to be realistic about mm -hmm. but i think at the same time this has sort of awoken a lot of interest about public health and awareness about the value of public health. And there's been a lot of faith in institutions, even when things haven't worked perfectly in systems. Yeah. I think there, there's a lot of trust in, in many countries. I mean, that can be improved in, in a lot of uh, settings, but, you know, kind of understanding that the messages are not always consistent that comes out. And that's something we can pr improve in the future about how do we get consistent messages that are, really clear and and mm -hmm. make these actions relevant to communities and kind of make sure that we're also meeting the other priorities of, of people, whether that's food security, it, you know, livelihoods. Uh, and I think we'll learn a lot from that. And I'm hoping that after this crisis, and hopefully that's, you know, sooner rather than later, we can harvest that attention and kind of all, all, everyone in it together in terms of solidarity to really prevent and reduce risks and impacts in the future. And, and I think we've seen this coming together in a new way that maybe we haven't seen before about global solidarity and global uh, approaches and opportunities and really bringing in other sectors. So because so many sectors are affected and businesses mm -hmm. are affected, we want to avoid that in the future. You know, the loss of, of lives, loss of livelihood. Yep. So, harvesting that in a positive way and saying okay what can we do for the future to make sure that we're bringing in the right expertise whether it's information managers whether it's uh you know communities that can feed into reporting systems to enhance surveillance i think we have to do that at all levels and really say we can contribute to public health and and we have to be empowered to be part of the public health system and value that and really embrace it Okay, thanks, Catherine. William, what, what do you think? Well, I certainly agree, and that somehow this conflict, you know, we've turned it into a, bi it's just a bilateral or two-sided conflict is a, yeah. um, somewhat of a product of, uh, not, I don't think that's really the public itself, but how the public is driven and divided. Um, so throughout history, we know certainly political leaders have, you know, amassed their side of their support. So, you know, it's easy to be used by, um, or to take advantage of that nature of people to, you know, put them on one side or another, and that's about some, an issue that for them personally, as Catherine was describing, is it's really about them getting to be able to go to work or make enough money to get food to feed their family. That's really their issue. Um, and then somebody else, is turning that into some divisive issue. But I think also we have to be a little humble in science. Um, we tend to say, well, the science is right, and that's what we should do. And then, you know, in my medical training, you know, we had to, we learned that, oh, the surgery is a success, but the patient died. So I think <laughs> there is more to life than just the science. And we do have to appreciate that there are other uh, cultural issues. There's other demands on people. They have other things. So it can't, it will never always just be the science. And we know that people don't make their decisions based just on facts. We, we use emotions and our concerns, our concerns for our family drive a lot of our decisions. So let's just be realistic about that and, and be honest with people and say, here's what we know. We understand, you know, show some compassion. And um, I, I think, I don't think it has to be that kind of a problem. And it, that uh, the thing about universal health care um, also kind of blends into this. So I think it's interesting because universal health care, I read into that once again, it's very response oriented. And um, maybe we should, so it's about the rights of all people to have health care. Maybe it's the rights of all people to be healthy. 
um, some matters about universal health, and then we can once again talk about uh, prevention and getting, you know, making sure people are healthy. It's not just a medical, it's not more doctors. It's a way we live on this planet to promote health. And I would love to see that discussed more. So an example might be food systems in case of uh, this COVID-19, this coronavirus, you know, there was some talk that, oh, it came from the markets and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And we're not sure exactly if that's true. But we do know these emerging diseases that start pandemics do come out of people eating certain types of animals. We could do things to prevent that. We could improve food systems in, in countries where they need it. People don't need to be eating bats and monkeys. So could we develop some food systems that are safe? That would protect, that would guarantee their health. That would be universal health by helping them have better food systems so we don't have pandemics and we don't have to go out and those, these are people that are, don't have another source of food. It's, they're not bad people. They don't have another source. And we need to invest to make sure they have safe and plentiful food, safe drink, clean drinking water, safe water. Those are things we can do to improve health, but to improve people's lives. Um, and it, I think that fits in with this concept of universal health, I'm gonna start calling it now. <laughs> um, and that you know that we do something as society as a whole to ensure that people have a healthy lives and they have their rights and they can have a productive lives and care for their families. Yep, yep. Um, I don't know if I, we have uh, much more time, but but I would like to to make you um, a question for for the three of you. Um, the same question. Uh, what are we leaving behind because of the fight against this coronavirus? What other infectious diseases, vaccines, peoples, regions, are we being left somewhat uh, abandoned because of this urgency that we, we are seeing in fighting this, this pandemic? What are we left, left in behind? Well, if I may just... Uh, um, uh, this week, we are putting out a, a new policy brief, precisely trying to capture that same question, the opportunity cost of, a, of, the, of focusing a, most of our resources and our political, a, a, both political and financial resources on the fight against coronavirus. And we try to illustrate that with a, three of the main pandemics affecting developing countries with like a, malaria, a, mm -hmm. a, and and uh, TB and tuberculosis, no? And for instance, I can, I can give you, I mean, some of the estimations that are now being carried out, uh, some of the models are suggesting that just six months of uh, stopping the, the usual routine, the treatment, which is not universal right now, but uh, imperfect as it is, is covering millions of people right now in terms of HIV antiretrovirals, for instance, uh, it, it could cost an additional one million deaths per year uh, one uh, half million in HIV and half million uh, in tuberculosis, no? which is something absolutely extraordinary. We are seeing that uh, across Africa in terms of the impact on uh, a routine immunization policies, for instance, uh, and, uh, and others. And, and we do have some precedents in this regard. Uh, for instance, in the uh, uh, in Democratic Republic of Congo at the Ebola and the Ebola crisis and the way it's affected. And so I, I think that this this can be huge and this is really important that, that that is why i want to come back to the broader to the broader argument that has been made because i couldn't agree more with what uh, both catherine and william have said uh, before and i think that william's approach to the concept of universal health coverage is the right one this is far beyond just reacting this is about preventing it is about uh, avoiding uh, healthcare uh, completely if, if at all possible because people yeah. have healthy lives and and this is about what Catherine mentioned health in all policies about the social economic environmental determinants uh, of health and addressing everything and this is i think the beauty of the logic of the agenda 2030 in that regard it provides us a framework a root map that can allow us to consider all these elements together. Uh, I think that the work that uh, uh, Eco Health Alliance is doing is absolutely fundamental in this regard. We are looking at this from the perspective of what we call planetary health uh, uh, and the, and the mm -hmm. so 
bringing together the health of the planet and the health of the human beings, uh, putting, to, putting prevention at the forefront, uh, putting a dignified food system, a, a, a basic income at, at this. So I, I think that this, this is very much what we are talking about. The COVID, the pandemic should be a, 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 a tragic, a, but, but really important inflection point in this regard. Global health is an investment. The way we need to look at this is comprehensive, implicated. We need to look at it from a total perspective, looking at all different uh, elements involved. It is not just a question of solidarity or philanthropy. It is in our own interest. There is no possible mm -hmm. way to guarantee uh, the, the, the well-being of, of northern countries if we are not considering what is happening in the rest of the planet. So all I think that we need to hammer this message and we need to make governments accountable to this and not, not go back to business as usual in 18 months when we have a vaccine or when we have for of a, a, I think this is a, a, a real a real opportunity in this in this regard. And I want to, to leave people with this optimistic message beyond the tragedy, which is obviously very real. Catherine William, do you want yes. to talk about what <laughs> what are we forgetting to <laughs> to think about? Totally agree with everything Gonzalo said. You know, I think uh, the current Ebola crisis in the Democratic Republic yeah. of Congo is challenging enough on its own without this other global crisis. So where we put our attention, you know, there are also animal uh, disease outbreaks right now, and and you know, how do we? keep going from one outbreak to another. I mean, that's just not efficient in, in any way. We really need to build back better. And I think this is an opportunity for a safer and more equitable world, as, as our colleagues have said. And, uh, you know, thinking about how do we make sure that those that basic access, that basic, that kind of minimum uh, it, it, detection capacity, surveillance capacity, so that, you know, and, and, and healthcare system capacity too, but also, uh, green uh, electricity systems, because if you have a vaccine, you, you probably need electricity to disseminate it. These factors that really affect deployment, not of just response to COVID-19, but all of the other aspects, health issues that, that we face. Um, and I, I, what really concerns me is the World Bank's projection that 49 million people will be plunged into extreme poverty from this crisis. That's undoing, you know, years or even decades of progress, and and really counter to what the Sustainable Development Goals are pushing for. So I, I agree that it's an opportunity, but we need to make sure to really focus on that equitable piece as we do hopefully build back better. And and Pablo, you had mentioned climate change earlier, and I think yep. we need to consider these global crises and then really find locally adapted solutions, but with quite a lot of urgency and kind of vigorous enthusiasm. Thank you, Catherine. W William, so something to, to add? Uh, I would only say that um, as Gonzalo too is referring to um, this, this thinking about how the world, you know, can be divided up or isolated uh, for pieces, and I think that awareness has come to everyone's attention that yeah. we are all here together, <laughs> and we're going to have to find out solutions and and helping other countries disease with disease problems or helping them prevent disease problems is not just philanthropy or charity. I like the that he made that point. It's really, it can be seen as selfish and that's okay that we're all in this together and we have to protect our, everybody has to be protected from these things. But I do, um, so I think in some ways there's a, a opportunity to kind of capture that thinking, but I do would like to see that expanded about what that really means um, and not just, okay, we can deal with this disease and then we, we, we solve the problem and forget about what is causing these diseases to occur. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity to work there. Now. And there's a, you know, the disparity in um, what we're seeing now, of course, will lead to lost lives. So as Catherine mentioned, the uh, estimated mortalities, but I, there's a weird ir irony in it too, in the wealthier countries, the more developed countries where people are lucky enough to be able to work from home you know, we're going to see the increase in diseases. They're not going to the doctor, so they're going to see more yeah. things related to obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And they're just sitting at home eating and not really active. And then, the, yeah. you know, the less developed part of the world is starving. Um, and we'll just have mortality from, you know, pure from poverty. 
So it's almost like this bimodal effect or barbell approach of, to just exaggerating the kinds of problems we've had before um, by this pandemic, you know, just disrupting systems. So it's a, it, these are serious issues. And, and if, ironically, they're not really medical. They're not medical. And I think Catherine referred to that right in the beginning of our conversation that it's not just a medical issue. That's not what's causing it. It's about our, how society operates. Um, so the response to the pandemic has caused far more economic damage than the virus, you know, is doing. It's not a medical expense. The, the cost of treating people is not the cost of the pandemic. The cost of the pandemic is people not working, but not being able to travel, not to be able to go out, the closing down of businesses. So well, I think that is, you know, really, when you talk about the, are we missing a cost, it's this huge impact on economic development. And the, of course, the poorest countries are going to suffer the most. It will take them years to pull out of this. And some of the rich countries are lucky and they can borrow money at low interest rates and they can issue bonds um, so that they can move out of this a little faster. But it is not evenly distributed, the pain of this disease um, and these outbreaks. And and I, I'm hoping that we see that in a new vi version of, you know, the future for us on this planet. Mm -hmm. I think we have a little more time. So I, we, I'm going to gonna ask a, a general question because you, the, the three of you are, are making a, a call for global action, you know, universal health coverage, uh, global prevention of, of these zoonotic diseases. But it seems uh, right now more, more difficult than ever because it, we, we need a, almost a geopolitical move from two countries that are fighting against each other. I'm thinking about China and the US that are competing against each other uh, in the global narrative of uh, who is to blame for this pandemic and so on. But uh, how do reconcile the, the, the fact that we need a global action in a world where the two superpowers are killing each other. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit pessimistic in, in this regard. I don't well, know, what, jump, what do you think? <laughs> I'll jump in first and just say, that's why we need you. That's why we need Politica Exterior. That's why we need... Um, <laughs> The media. We need um, children to be educated about the global nature of our future. So I, I, I'm not one just to defer and hope some politicians make the right decision. You know, we need to be active in what we talk about. We need society. People need to be engaged. And politicians will you know, eventually they have to come around and represent us because in many countries where they at least where they can vote they can have a voice in who's going to represent them. So it might not be this week or next week or next election, but if you look over the trend over time, um, societies do follow what people want. And the question is, can we um, give people information to make good decisions on? Because, um, of course, without good information, they can make bad decisions. But I'm not sure that what this conflict between China and the United States is a conflict about between American citizens and Chinese citizens. I, you know, there's a political layer on top of that, that, you know, that we're reading and seeing. If I go outside and ask somebody on the, my corner store what they think of China, they go like, well, I haven't really thought about China. What do you want me to think? So, I, you know, I, I do think, you know, we're kind of magnifying it. I'm not sure it's just the United Nations. I mean, we need a United Nations, um, but once again, um, I'm not sure that political adding another layer of politics is a solution. It's a good, you know, we have to have it, but I think the public um, needs to be, you know, more outspoken about what we want for our future and, um, and, and kind of demand that working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, sorry, Catherine, go ahead, please. No. I'll just briefly, you know, I think I'll add that, yeah, we, we don't have to wait around for the global institutions to have, you know, positive change. I think there's a lot we can just go out and do. And one thing that scientists can do is, you, you know, maintain or strengthen those collaborations with other countries, have that information sharing, that, that knowledge sharing, um, because I think the, the more 
you know, variability uh, that, that we know about, the more that we can develop solutions that really work and, and our best practices and then that can be locally implemented and adapted. So I think that collaboration, and of course it's not, you know, not just in science, but across the board, the more that we can do that with sharing approaches and, and collaboration, the better. Yeah, okay. I would like to say, well, first of all, that I agree with, uh, what I, I, I very much agree with what the year said. I would add that it's never been easy. I mean, it's not that it's not that we have ever had a situation where there were not. I mean, we built we built the multilateral the multilateral governance system in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, the the welfare states were built in the middle of crisis and and in the I mean, thinking about the Great Depressions and the kind of precedents that we can think about uh, right now. No, now we have the will of a good share of the of the global population. We have the science and we have the information uh, to do this. Uh, we have the, the shock that this crisis has provoked. Uh, I mean, if we are intelligent, it is possible to turn these shocks into opportunities yeah as we have seen in the in the past. And also, and this is related to the conversation that you were having before about science and the role that this is playing. More and more, I am convinced that, I mean, if we have to look at our audiences in a segmented way. I am less, less and less concerned about what I would describe our lovers. I mean, the people that mm -hmm. are going to agree with us, the haters that we are never, ever going to convince, and that includes uh, certain governments, and focus on, on, let's call them, the movable middle. I mean, that's 40, 60% yeah. of societies that, as you were mentioning before, they have the heart in the right place, but they have very legitimate concerns about uh, uh, their, living, uh, their living conditions, about, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. they, and, and they, they, we cannot expect them uh, uh, to have all the information that very often uh, we, we have on, this, on these aspects. We have to be empathic. We have to work on the emotions as much as the, as the rational uh, arguments. And we have to bring them along in that. And I think that very often we lose a lot of time thinking about the haters and, and feeding our lovers with the kind of messages that we like to hear ourselves and less focusing on that movable middle that I think that uh, is, is the ones that are going to turn the tide in the right uh, uh, direction. No? And this is true for, for many debates. I, am, I work on migration, which is a, a similar debate in that regard. This is yeah. true for the, for, uh, the, yeah. the kind of, of things that we are discussing uh, right now. But I am optimistic. I think that uh, eventually uh, we Let's hope that for the very reasons that Catherine and William know, I mean, in terms of, of the planetary limits and, the, and the, 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 the red lines that we are about to cross, that we have already crossed, that we do not arrive, to, uh, do not arrive late, no? But I believe that eventually we will get there. Yeah, it seems like uh, with the climate change debate, it, it, it has become mainstream and a lot of people are, are behind it. And uh, and it seems that it has uh, rained down from the scientific field, from the public opinion field. Do you think the, we, something will happen? Is is happening the same with the this health public health debate that the public will embrace it, uh, despite of some go some very high governance that are pushing against it. I'm thinking, and so William in, in in the U.S. Do you think this debate is going is going to to have roots in the in the society? Um, could you, what the? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah I, I, maybe yeah, I, no, I have so uh, what, what exactly the debate? <laughs> the the de question. <laughs> no, no, the debate about um, wearing masks, or the debate about healthcare, or the debate about. I'm sorry. Which part the, of that? Yeah, the, uh, thinking about the coming elections in November, obviously the the public health is going to be a hot topic in the in the debate. Do you think something is going to change specifically in the in the U.S. regarding this this debate? Uh, taking advantage of that there is a, a, an election and some candidates are pushing for it. Or do you think we are going to to business as usual in the U.S. specifically? Um, I would venture to guess that uh, 
the coming election in the U.S., the health care issue and the, health, the debates around um, health care and how that those systems that are provided. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. I'll start again. <clears throat> um, I would venture to guess that for the coming elections in November of this year for the United States, the debates about health care and how health care is provided will not be extremely different or very different than it was three years ago in 2016, the last election. Um, mm -hmm. The basic uh, issues are still there. I think with the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic right now, it, it is bringing it to attention right now. I'm not sure how much of that will persist until uh, November or if those other issues will come to light. But the underpinnings of who needs health care, I think that divide in our country in the U.S. is, is still there. Um, there might be, you know, more fewer people in the middle of that, and more maybe more people have decided one way or the other way about it, and uh, maybe there's less indecision um, or less confusion. Um, but I don't think that it's changed the actual the substance of that conversation about how we how we um, apply or provide uh, healthcare in the U.S. It's a mm -hmm. it's a big challenge in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have uh, right now, yes, finally run uh, out of time. So thanks, Gonzalo. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, William, for participating in this session and shedding some light on such an uh, important topics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank you for having us. Y esto sería todo. Muchas gracias también al espacio Fundación Telefónica por darnos la oportunidad de presentar el último número de la revista, lo enseño ya por última vez, eh, y poder hablar sobre, sobre temas, asuntos tan, tan importantes y a la vez tan urgentes. Eh, sigamos entre todos eh, repensando el mañana. Hasta pronto.